Good morning. And an official Happy New Year to everybody. It's good to see everyone out this morning, and I'd like to welcome you to Blue Ridge Grace Brethren Church, uh, and uh, it's just good to be together again. We have a few announcements before we get started. We have a, a full schedule this morning with the bread and the cup uh, towards the end of our service, uh, but a couple of things I'd like to draw your attention to. We'll be picking back up in Ecclesiastes this Wednesday morning with Bible study and prayer meeting uh, and uh, continuing on in our study there. Uh, and then Wednesday evening will be our first session of our new members class. Uh, so if you're interested in being a member here at Blue Ridge or just want to know a little bit more about us and what we believe and our history uh, and what we stand for, uh, that new members class will be the next three Wednesday evenings from 7 uh, till about 8-ish, 7.45, 8-ish, uh, and join us there for that. Uh, next week and in the weeks to come, we have a couple items on the agenda, uh, starting with Women of Grace next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Uh, they will be meeting to uh, discuss what this year of 2022 will look like for them, uh, ways that they will be ministering to us as a body, as a whole. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, if you haven't shown up to that before, uh, give it a shot. Showing up, fellowship with the other ladies here at church, uh, and be encouraged. Uh, and aside from that, uh, oh, uh, January 16th, uh, two Sundays from today, two weeks from today, will be our quarterly members meeting. Uh, so if you are a member here, uh, we would greatly encourage you to show up for that. Uh, stick around after the service for year-end reports, uh, and there might be a thing or two to vote on. I'll let you know after board meeting. Uh, next mo uh, Monday evening. Uh, but for that, that is all I have. Uh, and I'd invite you to stand with us as we open this morning's service with all creatures of our God and King. Uh, this is a hymn that we have in our hymnal, but uh, I'd encourage you to use the screens as the one verse is going to be different. There's a verse that's not in our hymnal that I really like. Uh, so as I get to design the service, it's my prerogative to say, let's use the screens and add the extra verse. Uh, so let's stand together uh, as we sing praises to the Lord.
morning. I invite you to join with me in reading Psalm 113, all nine verses of Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise our servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heaven. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of the people. He settles the barren woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. I invite you now to join your hearts with me as, as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, indeed, we do praise your name and we do praise come here to praise you. As your people who are called by your name and set apart, chosen by you, brought into your presence because of our faith, in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ who, who gave his life for us that we might have life and that we might have a relationship with you. And so we do come today and praise you. We're mindful of the fact that, that your people all across the earth are praising you. And yet, Lord, we know that though you have all knowledge and, and have the ability to, to be everywhere, at all times, that your focus is here in, in, the midst, in the midst of our fellowship today, just as much as it is in any other place in the world. And we just pray, Father, that our praises that we sing to you, that our devotion that we, we claim to have for you, and the lives that we bring to you will be found pleasing in your sight and that you too will rejoice as you see each of us, just as we rejoice as we see each other and have fellowship one with another and have fellowship with you and with all of the believers across the world now and throughout all time. We can't understand all these things, Father. They're, they're too great for us to even really comprehend, but they're real to you and they are real to us, and we thank you for that. And we pray today, Father, that as we continue to worship you, as we sing hymns of praise, as we, as we explore the truths that have been provided and, and been preserved for us through your word, will be shared by our pastor today as, as we hear these words and think about them that we'll go from this place further, determined to be your people and to represent you as we should. We ask for your forgiveness because we do this so imperfectly, and yet, Lord, we're, we're heartened by the fact that you know that, that that indeed is why you sent Jesus to earth to provide a way for us to be forgiven from our sin. Because it seems that no matter how hard we try, we, time and time again, fail to do just exactly what you would have us to do. But Father, we pray that each time that we, we do and each time that we examine our lives that we'll come back with renewed vigor in serving you and that ultimately, as your word teaches us, we'll ultimately be in your presence forever at a time and a place where sin will have no influence in us we look forward to that, Father, and praise you that you are providing such for us. 
So be with our congregation today. Be with those who are not able to be with us through their illness or travel. Even, Father, be with any that might not be with us due to indifference. Because, Father, that too can be something that you can deal with. And, and we pray that you will, that you will reach your hand out to each one who's a part of this church or is influenced by each of us in this church. We just pray, Father, that, that your, your touch will go out into this community and it will be stronger as a result of our having been here today. So bless our community, our state, our nation. We pray that your blessings will continue in this world. But most of all, Father, we pray that we in turn will be a blessing to you which, as you guide our lives in the paths you'd have us to take. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, please stand, take out a hymnal, turn to number 338. How from a foundation. Children's Church will be dismissed. Usually you talk a little bit longer than that. This past week, uh, I had the opportunity to see two of the most important and influential women in my life, my grandmothers, and those that are friends with me on Facebook probably saw those pictures uh, as well. Uh, the Lord has blessed me with two grandmothers whose lives I can only imagine pattern those of Lois, uh, Timothy's grandmother, whom Paul mentions in First uh, Second Timothy 1. Uh, where he singles Lois and Timothy's mom Eunice out as those of genuine faith. 
I'm not quite sure anyone has prayed for me more than either of these two women. Their position as grandmothers and the example of their lives demand that I hold them in high regard. When I was in college, my mom's side of the family gathered together to take a large family picture, one of two that I remember taking. Uh, Now, I was in college. None of my cousins were married yet. Uh, It was a relatively quiet affair, though I do remember it being kind of cold and and damp and and miserable. And there was some crankiness there. Uh, But the main thing I recall from that afternoon is how the photographer referred to my grandmother. He bestowed upon her the title Mother Superior. Now, we'll have Mother Superior sit here, and then you sit on this side of her, and you on this side of her, and Mother Superior, if we can get you out of this shot, we'll bring you in, Mother Superior, on the next shot. That was the title that he bestowed upon her that day. For a while, as the oldest grandchild, I tried to get Mother Superior to stick, uh, but here we are nearly two decades later, later, and it never really happened. Uh, But nevertheless, when we see someone in a position of prominence, worthy of respect and honor, who has proven themselves faithful, we naturally want to hold them in high regard. I'd imagine we all have people in our lives, whether parents or grandparents uh, or siblings or friends or co-workers, whom we greatly respect and for good reason. As we continue on in the book of Hebrews, the author continues to call our attention to the one who, who is worthy of our utmost respect and honor, the Lord Jesus. I invite and encourage you to turn with me to Hebrews 3. Hebrews chapter 3, where we will begin in verse 1. The author of Hebrews has now introduced Jesus at this point as the superior revelation, the superior prophet, uh, as well as how he is superior to the angels. We've most recently seen why he had to take on flesh and how that only makes him greater. Now, turning to Hebrews 3 this morning, we begin a new section in the book with a new comparison at hand. Not only is Jesus the superior revelation and superior to angels, but he is greater than those men who brought Israel up out of Egypt and through whom God gave the law. This morning, we will begin to see that Jesus is greater than Moses. This morning, we're going to see in Hebrews 3, verses 1 through 6, that because of his exalted position, we ought to give Jesus the consideration due him. Follow along as I read Hebrews 3, verses 1 through 6. The author writes, Therefore, holy brethren, Partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house." For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end." Before we dive into the text, would you go uh, to the Lord together with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning and for another year of your faithfulness in our lives. When we consider all that you bring us through and think of all you could possibly spare us from that we aren't even aware of, we pause to thank you for your goodness towards us. As we turn to your word, may your spirit increase our understanding of just how great Jesus is and how worthy he is of our love, worship, and daily devotion. Would he speak through me that I would be found true to your word? We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Because of his exalted position, we ought to give Jesus the consideration due him. This is precisely the command that the author of Hebrews gives in verse 1 of chapter 3. But before he does, he begins with the word, therefore. 
calling us to remember everything he said up to this point in chapters 1 and 2. Because Jesus is better than all the ways God previously communicated, because Jesus is God himself, because Jesus is greater than the angels, because Jesus will have all things in subjection to him, because Jesus shared in our flesh to destroy the devil, because Jesus shared in our flesh to release us from the fear of death, because Jesus was made like us in order to become our high priest, because Jesus made propitiation for our sins, because Jesus identifies with our suffering, therefore, we ought to act in a particular way. That list from the first two chapters could have been even longer, but I cut it short for the sake of time. Because of who Jesus is and what he's done, we ought to respond in an appropriate way. Remember, Hebrews was written to Jewish believers who were holding back from living out their faith so that they wouldn't face persecution, loss of livelihood, or perhaps even their loss of life. These weren't unbelievers. These weren't professing believers, those who confess Jesus but don't possess Jesus. The audience to the book of Hebrews is made up of believers. We don't need to look any further for proof than verse 1, even though I've given ample proof in the past two months. But in verse 1, the author calls them holy brethren and partakers of a heavenly calling. Now, believers in Jesus are called holy or they're called saints throughout the New Testament. That is a common term for them there. And uh, they're likewise called brethren or brothers and sisters throughout the New Testament. Both are terms that apply to believers. But here in verse 1, the author combines the two, really driving that point home that you are holy brethren, These two words are found together only one other time in the New Testament. And that's in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 27, where Paul is commanding that that letter be read to all the holy brethren. Why would the author refer to them as such if he knew they weren't believers? Not only is the author's audience holy brethren, but he seems to drive that point home all the more by saying that they are partakers of the heavenly calling. These men and women share in the heavenly calling as the NIV and ESV translate it. God has called them like he has called us who believe today to represent him on the earth. Thank you, Bob, for using that phrase in your prayer this morning. I'm like, oh, it's a great tie And We represent God on earth, those of us who believe. Our calling is to be his hands and his feet and his voice in the world. And if we remain silent, who else is going to stand up and proclaim him? That's not something that can be said of anyone who hasn't believed in Jesus. If the author knew these were unbelievers, he would by no means use these terms. But because the book was written for believers, then we know the book also applies to those of us who believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins today. The warnings the author gives to these first century believers apply to us today. And sadly, we need to pay attention and heed these warnings just as the first century church did. The author calls his readers then and now to consider Christ Jesus. Consider Christ Jesus. The NIV translates it rather appropriately as fix your thoughts On Jesus. The Greek word the author uses isn't merely a glance or a fleeting look. Oh, look, there's Jesus. All right, back to what what I was doing before. When we consider Christ Jesus, we are to carefully think about him. We are to ponder him. We are to meditate on who he is and what he's done. We are to keep him in mind as we walk through this life. The author of Hebrews is drawing our attention to all that he's written so far in the first two chapters, and he's saying, pay close attention to what I'm writing here. Pay close attention to the subject uh, at hand. What we read in the book of Hebrews is important. It's not without consequences or ramifications. 
The author talks about our confession. He's joining in on that confession, further emphasizing that he knows he's writing to believers. He's saying, look, think about all that we know to be true. Jesus is the apostle. He is the one sent by God. Consider Jesus. He is our high priest. He stands before God on our behalf, having offered himself as a sacrifice. How can we think so lightly of Jesus in this case? How can we think then so highly of the Son of God and then shrink back from suffering for his name's sake? How can we say, on the one hand, Jesus, you are great. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for all that you've you've done for me, all your grace and your mercy. I'm going to go attend to this now over here. That is not a, a sane mindset. That is not a rational mindset. We can't have both existing in the same way. Brothers and sisters, we must consider who Jesus is and what he's done. We must fix our thoughts on Jesus. We who have believed in him for the forgiveness of our sins as a sacrifice satisfying God's wrath against our sins, it is inappropriate inappropriate for us to live life in any other way. The author speaks to us today in our society, warning us that we can't blend in with the world and think that there won't be consequences. We may have eternal life secured through Jesus' death, but there is still much at stake by refusing to live boldly for him. So what is it that we must consider? In the remainder of our passage today, the author draws our attention to three ways in which Jesus is better. And he now brings in an Old Testament saint for comparison, the man Moses. From time to time, the authors of the New Testament will shine a spotlight on an Old Testament figure, usually to help illustrate a a point they are trying to make, especially when dealing with ethnic Jews being able to demonstrate from the Old Testament a timeless truth will go a long way in these ethnic Jews in believing that truth. Paul does it often with Abraham demonstrating that friendship with God was never designed to come through the the law of Moses. Rather, it was always through believing God. Now, for his purposes, the author of Hebrews is going to draw up Moses and use him as an example in comparing and contrasting him with Jesus. The author begins in verse 2 where he writes, "...to consider Jesus." who was faithful to him who appointed him, that is the father, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. The first reason the author gives for us to consider Jesus in his exalted position is his faithfulness. Jesus was faithful. The author of Hebrews compares him with Moses, who God had previously declared faithful in all my house. This is a quote from Numbers 12. Turn with me to Numbers 12, the clear other end of Scripture. In Numbers 12, Moses' siblings, Miriam and Aaron, uh, begin to grumble about their brother's leadership, wondering why Moses has the lion's share of responsibility and, along with it, the lion's share of glory. You know, God, you you put Moses in charge of everything. It's not fair. We, We want a slice of that. You know, we, we want to share in all his responsibilities and his leadership and, and the honor that, that our fellow Israelites are bestowing upon him. The Lord, hearing this, calls the three of them, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, to the tent of meeting, the tabernacle of meeting, where he gives Aaron and Miriam a full dressing down. In Numbers 12, we read this in verses 6 through 8, God speaking to them, he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. And that's the phrase the author of Hebrews takes and and installs in Hebrews 3. But he continues in verse 8, God says, I speak with him face to face, not in a vision, not in a dream. I speak with Moses one on one, even plainly. 
and not in dark sayings, and he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And here are Aaron and Miriam hearing God speak of their brother in high regard, saying, I have a relationship with Moses I don't have with you. Get over yourselves. You should be afraid to talk to me that way. You should be afraid to bring this matter before me concerning my faithful servant, Moses. And it's then in that chapter that Miriam develops leprosy. God's point here in Numbers 12 is that Moses was a faithful servant, a faithful representative in God's house among God's people. God had raised Moses up. He had called Moses to represent him and to serve him. And Moses was faithful to that calling. The author of Hebrews is using this example from Numbers to instruct these believing Jews that if they thought Moses was faithful, if they thought Moses was hot stuff, Jesus was more so. Jesus was and is steadfast in fulfilling what God has called him to do. The Father sent the Son to earth to die on the cross for our sins. And praise the Lord, he was faithful in that task. But along the way, he faced ridicule, abandonment, persecution, suffering, and it all culminated on the cross. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the night he was betrayed, Jesus prayed to the Father, asking for a reprieve, yet ultimately submitting himself to the Father's will. He was faithful to the task at hand. And he now continues to be faithful to his task. We saw last week in Hebrews 2, verse 17, that he is a faithful high priest. In Revelation 1, verse 5, John refers to Jesus as the faithful witness. Indeed, by the time we near the end of Revelation, Jesus returns to the earth in Revelation 19, where in verse 11, John records his title, Jesus' title, as faithful and true. It's who Jesus is. We must consider his faithfulness and let it spur us on as his children to a life of faithfulness, even if it means facing the same level of trials that Jesus faced in his life as well. That's what was on the docket for these Jewish believers in the early church. They were facing death. All of Jesus' disciples, except for one, John, died a martyr's death. And even then, John died in exile, not with society as a whole. You know, we are petrified of standing out for Jesus. Jesus executed his tasks faithfully and perfectly, and he has called us to do the same, regardless of the consequences. Will we be faithful? We also must consider the fact that Jesus has more glory and honor than Moses. Look at verses 3 and 4 back in Hebrews chapter 3, where he writes there, For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God." Because of his exalted position, we ought to give Jesus the consideration due him. And we must consider his greater glory and honor. Now, Jesus is contrasted with Moses. Moses was great. He held a place of prominence in God's plan for his people. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he was said to be faithful to that calling, which is no small matter. But Jesus, Jesus is greater he is more glorious. He deserves a greater and higher honor. The author of Hebrews goes back to this idea of the house that we saw in verse 2, where he writes, He who built the house has more honor than the house. We saw in Numbers 12 how Moses was faithful in all of God's house. He was a faithful representative. He was a faithful steward. He functioned as a priest between God and the Israelites. He served in the tabernacle well, but Moses wasn't the main event. 
Moses wasn't the central figure in that story. God was. In fact, the author of Hebrews is going to come back around to Moses in Hebrews 11 and list him as an example of what it looks like when faith turns into action. There in Hebrews 11, the author tells us explicitly that Moses kept Christ as the central focus, not even God. Moses kept the Messiah as his central focus, verses 24 through 26. By faith, Moses When he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That would have given him a life of luxury. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, the reproach of the Messiah, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Why? He looked forward to the reward. Moses chose to suffer rather than enjoy sin. He considered Christ to be greater than the treasures of Egypt. And why? Verse 26 says he looked to the reward. So how much greater then is Jesus? If he is the one to whom Moses looked, he clearly is better than Moses. And not only that, while Moses served in God's house, as we'll see in verse 5, Jesus is the one who built that house. The Son is the one who established his kingdom on the earth, and it placed men and women to rule over it in his place, to represent him on this earth, just as Moses did 3,500 years ago. The potter is greater than the clay. The architect is greater than the house. The engineer is greater than the car. Jesus is greater than all because he is the one who built us. He is the one that built this creation. If all these Jewish believers were impressed with Moses under whose law they were seeking to hide and find shelter, how much greater then is Jesus? Jesus has more honor and glory. This is something we ought to carefully consider. And there's one more contrast to be found in our passage today. Look at verses 5 and 6. The author writes, And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. If we were to strip away these dependent clauses for a moment, we see the contrast come into focus more clearly. Again, the same verses. Indeed, Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant, but Christ as a son over his own house. They both were faithful. But then Jesus pulls ahead. Moses was faithful in the house, but the son is over the house. Moses participated in the house. He was faithful in his role as God's mediator, functioning as a priest. But Jesus? Jesus presided over the house. Jesus built that house. He owned that house in which Moses served. And Jesus was the one who handed it over to Moses so that he would be a steward of the house. Indeed, Moses was a servant But he's no match for the son who built the house. As we go back to those dependent clauses and add them back in, consider what the author writes in the latter half of verse 5. The author says that Moses served as a testimony of those things which would be spoken of afterward. Moses was a testimony of those things which would be spoken of afterward. In Hebrews 10, the author states it this way in verse 1. The law was a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of things. Moses was not the main event. The law was not the main event. It never was. Even as soon as as God had handed it down to Moses, it was never about the law. Both of these things, Moses and the law, indeed all of the Old Testament, served to point forward to the main event, the Son of God, the Messiah, Jesus. All of the things Moses did, all the ways in which he was faithful, uh, served to point to Jesus. 
The Old Testament isn't about what Moses did. It's about the Son of God to which he pointed. It's not about David and Goliath or Daniel and the lion's den. It's about the Son of God to which they pointed. It's one of the biggest uh, faults of these children's Sunday school curriculums that many of us grew up with. We're going to read about David and the lion's den or Daniel and the lion's den. We're going to read about David. We're going to read about Solomon. But they fail to move past that so that they see and focus on the Messiah behind it all. The law was not about being saved by works. It was to point out the Israelites' sin so that it could also point them to their Messiah, Jesus. Do we, in our lives, point others to Jesus? It's easy to read the Old Testament and think, ooh, look at Moses. He was faithful. Look at all he got to do for God. But the New Testament tells us we should read the Old Testament and think, Look at the Son. Look at the Messiah. When people look at you or me or us today, are they in awe of us or are they in awe of Jesus? Is the object of our time and energy and money about making a name for ourselves or are we pointing others to Jesus through how we steward those things which God has given to us? It makes a difference. Only one of those options is pleasing to the Lord. Indeed, that's how the author ends in the last phrase of verse 6 where he writes, whose house we are, we as believers are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. We are Jesus' house, like Moses was, if we hold fast to the end. This phrase trips a lot of people up, but... That's where the context will help us. Again, the author is writing to an audience he knows well. He's established that he knows them as believers. When we consider this idea of a house in our passage this morning, we see that Moses was a faithful steward, a faithful steward, a servant, a faithful priest in God's house. There were others of the nation of Israel that weren't so faithful, including Moses' own siblings, Aaron and, and Miriam. And his nephews, Nadab and Abihu, Aaron dies. What's the first thing Aaron's sons do? Let's see what other ways we can sacrifice to God. And what? God kills them on the spot. They were unfaithful as priests. In fact, in the next few weeks, we're going to look at the generation in the wilderness that rejected God's promise because they didn't believe they could conquer the promised land. And the author warns us today not to be unfaithful like them. Those unfaithful Israelites weren't representing God. They weren't being faithful to their calling as children of the promise. They weren't pointing others to the Son through their lives. There was no priestly action taking place there, and God punished them severely because of it. They died in the wilderness. Their chance has come and gone. But we still have that opportunity today. We have the opportunity to be faithful and to represent God as a kingdom of priests in this world. A royal priesthood, as Peter writes in 1 Peter 2 verse 9. And if we are faithful, if we hold fast and adhere firmly to the confidence that we have until the end, if we function as these priests of God, representing God the way he has called us to, we too will represent him as his house, just as Moses did. We can join Moses, as again the author of Hebrews wrote in chapter 11, verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in this world. For we can look forward to the reward that is ours when we do so. So what do we choose? Do we choose affliction with our brothers and sisters in Jesus? Or do we choose the passing pleasures of sin? Only one of those qualifies as a faithful steward. What would we rather have, the treasures in this world or sufferings with Jesus? 
Only one qualifies us as God's representatives on this earth. What takes priority? Gathering together as commanded as believers? Or literally anything else? Well, you know, it was a long week. Uh, I need to rest before Monday rolls around again. Uh, My kid has a game early Sunday afternoon, so I, I can't make it to church. We were up late last night. Oh, well, you know, Christmas was yesterday, or in the case of this coming year, well, it, it's Christmas. I can't go to church on Christmas. It's a family day. No, it's a day to celebrate. I won't get on my soapbox again today, but you, you know where I'm headed with that. In Acts, the early church met daily, and yet there are so many believers today that can't even make a weekly commitment to the command to gather together, as we will see very soon in Hebrews 3 and 4. The author of Hebrews joins the chorus of the writers of Scripture when he states that there is a reward in store for those who serve and worship and represent Jesus here on this earth, no matter the cost. The way we keep this mindset, the way that we are transformed in the image of Jesus, is giving Jesus the consideration due him. When we think highly of who he is and what he's done, of all the word of God reveals of him from Genesis through Revelation. And when we ask ourselves if pleasure and disobedience and sin is worth it, that the answer is no, it's not. And as we ask ourselves, is Jesus worthy? That the answer is a resounding yes, he is. It is then And only then that we will obtain our reward. It is then and only then that we as believers can hear those words, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Consider who Jesus is. Consider what he's done for you. Read in his word how great and gracious and merciful and loving God has been to you. Meditate on those things so the only course of action, the only thing that can come to mind is I need to serve him. I need to be faithful to Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for our time in your word this morning. Thank you for your son, Jesus. As the familiar chorus goes, all that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of 10,000 in my blessed Lord I see. Father, as we prepare to partake of the bread and the cup, may we consider Jesus. May we fix our eyes on him. May we bring him to mind and the work that he did on the cross on our behalf. May your spirit help us to live lives of faithful service in the days ahead, considering Jesus to be worthy of it all. We pray this in his matchless name. Amen. And of that name, would you take your hymnals and turn to hymn number 204. Hymn 204, as we prepare for communion and reflect upon Jesus, would you stand and sing that beautiful name.
first would the deacons come forward to prepare for the bread and the cup. I love and bless thee. We just saw in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 3, that we are to consider Jesus. I don't know about you, but that's difficult most of the time. You know, we leave here, we go about our, our day-to-day, our weekly tasks, and, uh, you know, before we know it, we kind of forget about Jesus. We don't consider him the way that we all, we don't hold him in high regard and, and meditate upon and contemplate all his abundant mercies in our lives. It's almost as our creator that Jesus knew that we would have a difficult time with that. And so before he left the earth, he instituted two ordinances, two things that he has commanded to his church to observe, to draw us to remember what he did on the cross for our sins. And this morning, we celebrate one of those in the bread and the cup. What we celebrate this morning The bread and cup that we partake calls us to consider Jesus, to reflect upon what he's done when he died on the cross for our sins, recognizing that it was nothing that we did or could do. We couldn't meet God halfway in our sins. God had to reach down to us and do that work of reconciliation on our behalf. And because Jesus died on the cross, our sins are forgiven. God no no longer looks upon us as enemies, but he looks upon us as friends. So as we partake this morning, consider Jesus. Reflect upon that truth uh, that Jesus instilled in the bread and in the cup. The New Testament warns us not to take these elements in an unworthy manner. The elements that we are about to pass, uh, pass around are for believers only. If you have never believed in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, please let these elements pass you by. It's just a piece of matzo bread and a cup of grape juice to you. But if you are a believer, these elements are for you, causing us to remember and reflect. And even then, Paul warns us not to partake in an unworthy manner as believers to come before this table with ongoing and unconfessed sin in our lives. And so I'd like for us to take just a moment in the quietness of our own hearts to go before the Lord, to go before our Heavenly Father uh, on account of our great High Priest, Jesus, who stands in His midst, and confess those sins that are ongoing in our lives, that we may remember and reflect and partake of the bread and the cup in a worthy manner. Let's go together before the Lord. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, while they were still eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and passed it around, said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Deacons, would you please stand?
as we partake together, remember the body of Jesus broken for you. Let us partake together. Then he took the cup, and after blessing it, passed around to his disciples, saying, Drink, all of you. This is my blood shed for you. As you drink, remember the blood of Jesus shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Let us partake together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joy that we have to pause and remember and reflect upon the death of your Son on the cross for our sins. Help us to consider his body broken his blood shed not just by the hands of men, but by your holy and eternal will for the forgiveness of our sins. 
May this serve as a reminder for us, as you intended it to, that we were bought at a price. And we are to therefore glorify you in our bodies and in our spirits, which are yours. And now unto him, the apostle and high priest of our confession, the Lord Jesus Christ, the faithful one worthy of all glory, to him be honor and majesty and power forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please fellowship with one another as you leave.